I wanted this to be kind of a personal sharing of stories of these individuals who are very close friends of Lloyd. And so we're going to begin by, um, uh, we'll talk, start with uh, Jim here, just talk, telling us about when he first met Lloyd, what his impressions were, and any reflections that he may have that he wants to share as they were beginning this new school. And it was always a struggle to keep the doors of IAI open. So he might want to share that and whatever you want to share, Jim. Nineteen sixty-two. That was a long time ago. Um, fortunately, I do have a pretty good memory. Um, well, I was uh, art director of the American schools in Europe when I heard about the school <laughs> and applied uh, as for the art director position. And the first, and then I heard from uh, Dr. Boyce and Lloyd that. Um, uh, Lloyd had been hired by the art director, but Lloyd wanted me for his assistant as the art, assistant art director. And I accepted that and came to Santa Fe, which I'd never been to before, and lived in a room in the dormitory, which was being emptied out. And um, uh, Lloyd wasn't there. He was involved with a project called the Rockefeller Fund Project in Tucson. In, uh, Tucson. And so he was very busy there with Charles and Audley Lolama, uh, doing uh, work, teaching, kind of preparing, this is how we'd like to work with students. And there were a number of students there, um, George Bordeaux and um, uh, Manfred Sissonkova and Elmer Chavarria. And they were trying these different approaches to teaching art. Uh, they were doing silk screening, they were doing um, clay on the wheels, they were doing different things, different techniques, and they were a little unusual. And that was kind of where I first met Lloyd. I did go to Tucson to see um, what was happening. And um, I, I, we got the idea that, um, yes, we can give um, new techniques and new ideas, but we were looking at our spirits and our souls, where all this was coming from. And I think that was kind of the source of, um, of, of how the Institute got developed, was that project with, um, um, based on Lloyd's philosophy of working from, from our hearts. And um, th that was kind of our first, my first contact with Lloyd. And that was in May of 1962. Uh, we were supposed to open up the school in September. <coughs> And we had that uh, Indian school campus to refurnish, to, um, um, to put it into this new school. And it was quite a job of setting up studios and oh, how to do the dormitories. And um, so I was pretty much involved with that. Lloyd was always, um, the main thing about Lloyd, one of the things, when he worked with any of us in the school, um, he knew us somehow intuitively in such a way that he'd say, this is what we need to do, and he just let us do it. He didn't, it never imposed anything on us that this was the way to do it. He just let us get to get things done. And I think I, that was one of the most beautiful things uh, about Lloyd. Um, during the time he was there, um, classes, uh, Dan can talk about those, but it seemed like it was from dawn to, dawn to dark uh, that these classes were running. And um, we often got into trouble because there was the student services uh, division, there was the academic division, then the art division. And of course the art division, we wanted to do it our way and we, we kept the studios off and it opened at night and uh, kind of got into trouble occasionally. And, um, but anyway, uh, one of the things that Lloyd did also, I remember it so well, and I have to show some examples. Um, we had a campus that needed artwork, and he would have the students um, do the artwork for the campus. This is a model of a sculpture 
uh, that Larry Avacana, uh, uh, Inuit from Alaska, uh, developed in the, in the sculpture department. And this became, I guess, about five feet high after a while. And I believe it's still on the new canvas, I, I hope. But th this was a sketch that uh, Larry had done. But to all the campus, we, we, um, there were fountains that Charles worked with Douglas Crowder from Oklahoma. There were sculptures and there were murals on the buildings. And um, it was like, this was a, a this was the, well the students owned the school, is what it kind of amounted to. And they did all the work, the dorm, uh, textiles in the dormitories, um, paintings in the, in the, in the buildings. Uh, it, it was, uh, that's how it got developed. Another thing he did, Um, here is a book that had uh, textiles on it, and the students in the writing uh, department and in the printmaking department, there were these wonderful projects that were ongoing constantly that were beyond the classrooms. And uh, uh, again, it was that 24-hour idea. This is, what, this is how the school functioned is that art was a way of life, and um, it was always involved with the students doing extra things. We always had these projects, the summers particularly. One summer there was a, a, a tribe in Florida called the Miccosukees, which I don't think many of us knew about, and they were building a school, a bait and tackle shop, and a, a, a tribal building, and they wanted some artwork. So we kept a lot, number of the students behind that summer, and, they, and the Miccosukee sent us moss from the, the trees and shells from the beaches and coconut palms. So these were the inspirations from that environment. And the whole summer, the students developed paintings and sculptures and lamp bases and textiles for this particular um, tribe. And those, those summer projects were important that Lloyd always supported and always sort of found them somewhere. Well, uh, we didn't always know where they were coming from. And then there were other projects. Um, the, the, Carter Baron, the Carter Baron Theater in Washington, um, somehow Lloyd worked with, uh, again, Secretary uh, of the Interior, uh, Stuart Udall, uh, to put on a program at the Carter Baron Theater. And the students, again, um, with dance, and, and Lewis Ballard with music, and. Roland Meinholz with drama put on a big theatrical event. And later on, there was a group that um, went to the White House to dance for uh, President Yami Yogo of, of, of Upper Volta. There are all these projects that were going on all the time that took the students off the campus and put them into the so-called the big world. And, um, and I think that had a lot to do with, again, the world knowing about the Institute. And it wasn't only there. Life, mag Life Magazine came out with a big spread on, um, on the Institute. Um, so that, that was part of it, too, is that uh, it's, it's sort of like the country woke up somehow and, just, and, and, and sort of found us. Uh, so that was part of it. Um, Lewis Ballard and music developed uh, a wonderful uh, choral work and put out records of uh, the student work. So there were always things going on that um, exposed the world of the Institute to um, beyond, but it was always Lloyd's emphasis. And, and we really didn't know what was going on. Uh, it, it, it just sort of happened. Uh, we, didn't have any, um, we didn't have any examples. Uh, we just had a philosophy that out of who we were, Something can grow that might be new, and um, and and it was. And uh, this is kind of where we're at today. And I can just suspect it'll always continue to be new. Not just Lloyd new, but new new in terms of uh, expression. So those are some of the things to share with you. Okay. Thank you, Jim. 
Uh, Dan, you want to go next? Uh, my first uh, introduction to Lloyd was probably in the mid-60s. I went to the school. I actually was, uh, I attended uh, University of Kansas on a scholarship, art scholarship. And um, one of my instructors uh, told me about this new school that was uh, designated for Native Americans in this country. So I applied and I was accepted. And the first time I uh, met Mr. New was um, in the, the old campus, they had uh, what they called the team teaching room. And um, usually there was uh, a school rally in that, in that room. Um, it, was, it was a large room. Uh, it was in, located in the academic building. Anyway, when they introduced Lloyd, uh, he walked up to the stage and he was so well dressed. He had a nice blazer on with his uh, uh, pocket square and a scarf. And he did look like a fashion designer. Um, well-groomed and very articulate when he spoke uh, to, the, to the students. And he would do this every year to all the new attendees of, of the institute. But um, what sticks in my mind about Lloyd and, and Jim uh, just touched on it was that he wanted the students to feel free to express themselves however they wanted through the mediums that was there that was available to them. And he also was very uh, adamant about experimentation. And um, at the school, um, I, that's, that's really where I, I really started experimenting with the different mediums that I was uh, exposed to. And one of my instructors was Adelie Loloma, and she always pretty much pushed me in that direction, to always feel free to experiment. I remember when she would come into class in the morning, into the painting class, um, she'd come in and she'd say, okay, students, I want you to create and then she would repeat it again, create, create, create. And so that, that basically stuck in my mind. And so um, that really was a real strong turning point in my life as a young artist was the school. Um, not only that, but um, the direction that Lloyd wanted all the students to go creatively and to just continue to do what you wanted expressively. Um, the other thing about Lloyd was um, his designs. Some of the designs he would work with, some of the students. Um, one of the students became one a close friend of mine, Manfred Sasankiwa, and he's a member of the Hopi tribe. Um, they, uh, Manfred would come up with some of these designs and work with Lloyd and they would do these silk screens and some of the, it, it became part of the fashion um, as far as the shirts and the dresses and I thought they were very, very uh, much for that period or in that, and that time very innovative and, and beyond what um, a lot of native artists were doing in this country. But anyway, uh, that that's probably my take on Lloyd. And then eventually we became friends um, over the years. And he retired and I continued to be friends with him. Um, there was a moment in the early 1970s, I had just uh, got my military discharge from the Marine Corps. And I came back to Santa Fe and decided to go back to the school and visit you know, some of the um, the old instructors. And um, Otto Lilolma said uh, to me, she said, what, what are your plans? And I said, well, I'm not really sure. 
but I got a, I got a job, job offer at uh, a foundry down in Shidoni, or um, Tusuki, and it's called Shidoni Foundry. And it had just opened, and um, Tommy Hicks worked there, or he was the owner of the foundry, so he hired me. But um, Audley said, I, I actually would prefer you to go to school, continue your schooling, so um, she said, why don't you go over and talk to Lloyd? There's only like a couple months left in the school year, and uh, maybe you can get some studio space. And so I did, I went over and, and um, met with Lloyd, and he was all excited to see me back, and, uh, and he said, well, he said, sure, we can, we can uh, accommodate you for the next couple months, you know, the school year. And so I was always thankful for, for, uh, for that opportunity, again, from Lloyd. And, um, you know, since then I've been just uh, continuously experimenting and, and working with my art. And, um, but Lloyd has um, always been a, a strong mentor in my life. He's always been a strong inspiration and will, you know, continue to be a strong ins inspiration f to me. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Hi, Shen. Well, first of all, I don't know where to start from. Uh, in my position, it's very difficult to, to start the story uh, because it's itself, between Lloyd and myself, is such an incredible and long story. So before I get my thoughts together on that, I wanted to be here just to share in case you have some um, questions about personal side of our, our lives together. <clears throat> oh, now I feel like Michael Jackson. How is that? <laughs> Excuse me. Um, well, first of all, I want to take this opportunity again to thank Della Warrior, to begin with Della Warrior, and the entire staff of uh, New M Museum of Indian Arts and Culture. The whole idea came from the fact that Lloyd and I were driving by this road, Camino Lejo, in early our marriage. Uh, we, were, we were married in 1995, December. Um, we were driving along and he showed me a house and uh, he said he lived there when he first came to Santa Fe, but he rented the house and then they moved him to the campus so then he said, well, this house was sold $40,000 back then. It's a magnificent house. And I said, well, why didn't you buy it? He said, well, sweetheart, I didn't have 40 cents in my pocket. <laughs> Divorce took everything. You know, he left his wife and family because they did not want to move to Santa Fe uh, as he did. Uh, the business was good. But he said that his lifelong <clears throat> dream was to educate young Indian artists. So that's why uh, he just made the choice. And I felt um, so touched by his being so selfless and generous. And I said, well, you know, I'm sure your people will always remember you for the sacrifices that you have made. And he said, well, I don't know. Uh, life is not like that usually. Just watch, once I die, 15 minutes after my memorial, nobody would remember me. Well, I said, well, we'll see about that. <laughs> so um, anyway, that was a long time ago. Um, <clears throat> when I came to his uh, uh, ha uh, home and his life, actually, uh, he was already um, writing his memoirs uh, for a long time. But he was taking his time. And then in time, we realized that time was getting shorter, and uh, Gary Avey, late Gary Avey from Native People magazine, wanted to do the book. Um, so book took a while. Um, we had to edit it several times. And um, it was all about his life. He wanted the book to be uh, uh, some kind of uh, inspiration to young Indian uh, students so that if he made it, as a young Cherokee boy, the youngest of 10 children of a very, very poor family in Oklahoma, a farming family. 
he thought uh, it should be easily available to young people when it's finished and that they should be inspired. If Lloyd made it, we can make it too out of that poverty. And that was his main dream to accomplish. And so the book um, took a while. There were some setbacks uh, from the publishers. Um, so finally, we finished the uh, editing through some professional help and grant from Kellogg Foundation. Um, so with that book, um, uh, before it was published, um, I just thought it would be great, this birthday coming up in two years, I start planning uh, some kind of an exhibit in the same line of his um, chapters of the book. Book is titled Sound of Drums. He chose that title because his mother always said, whenever you're in dire situation, you need help, just stop and listen to the sound of drums. So he just loved that. So we titled the book uh, as Sound of Drums. Um, so along with that, um, I prepared a project along with the lines of that um, memori uh, the, oh, um, the book. I'm running to <laughs> kind of forgetful, getting forgetful with the words. Um, well, my hope was to celebrate his life um, on the 100th birthday, which would be uh, coming up. And I approached Della when she became the director, and she was kind enough to take the project to the uh, higher-ups, and then they were kind enough to uh, accept it. So then uh, IAIA also joined, as, as Della told you earlier. Um, and I want to, uh, actually, I want to ask the gentleman who has the book. I haven't seen it. Would you please, sir, bring it to us? He surprised me last night at the opening, um, saying that he bought it at the gift shop at IAIA. I was shocked. I thought it was coming up next week. And there it is, Mr. Nev himself. Um, it's a wonderful story of his life. <coughs> Um, from childhood all the way uh, to Santa Fe. And uh, Jim McGrath was kind enough to help us with the years, um, because Lloyd was a very humble man, as you may know by now. He did not, uh, he said, if anybody has to write something, what I have done at IAIA, it should not be me, it should be somebody else. So I couldn't think of anybody else better than Jim, as you heard him. He helped us with that chapter of the book. Now, um, while we have it here, they only brought only, did you say, 10 or 12 copies to IAIA as a sample, so probably sold by now. But next week, I'm sure it will be available, both here and the IAIA gift shop. So with that, that's the um, story behind the exhibits, and I think everyone did a wonderful job. And if you haven't been to IAIA Museum, I suggest make time to see it, because here it's his life that is very important, of course, but there, three um, young people, archivist Ryan Fleehive, Tatiana Lomahaftova, and Rosemary Kutopria, they uh, work together. Rosemary created the boutique in uh, Scottsdale, in one side of the uh, gallery. And uh, then in the North Gallery, you will see the painting he did during the World War II. He was on USS Sanborn as a Navy officer, but his job was paint the war, basically. So it's a wonderful, huge collection, but they are only able to show four or five of them for this time being, but hopefully in the future there will be simply an exhibit for the World War II paintings. He was in Japan in the Pacific Theater, then he went to Philippines and Batanga and returned home through the way of Kodiak Island. So it's an excellent exhibit, but the best part of the exhibit, I think he would be so proud, in the center gallery, it's a huge gallery, it is the student work from 1962 to 67 under his instructions. Student textiles are just mind-boggling. It's a magnificent exhibit. And next Thursday, 18, is his birthday. We have a party, so you're all invited. <laughs> and um, so that's that. And our private life, I don't know 
what you would like to hear or what should I say. I don't know at this point, so I'm going to leave it to you. If you have any questions. How did you meet? Oh, now that's a $1 million question. <laughs> no, it's not that, but it's, it's a very long story because um, actually um, my life has a lot to do with it, so I have to inject that, but then it takes too long. <laughs> but um, briefly, we, uh, if, you, if you want me to answer you directly, I was working at Douglas Cardinal's office as his office manager. He came from Canada, and the poor guy had no idea about the politics of Washington, so <laughs> I was there by then about 20 years. So a mutual friend uh, asked me to work for him, and I did accept the job. The second day on the job, Douglas said he asked from Smithsonian to um, bring all his elders from all over the country to put their vision into the planning session. So I went, um, Douglas asked me to go to Smithsonian basement and check if the mics are working, if everything was okay. So I walked down in there, there he was, Mr. New himself, sitting there with his ponytail and beaded cane and beaded moccasins, and I just freaked out practically. <laughs> and so, um, but the funny thing, six years prior to that, I had met him at a mutual friend's house. See, this is why it gets longer, because I have to then tell you how I met that lady which is in time of my uh, service at the Turkish Embassy as a social secretary and a protocol officer. She was on the list, a uh, Cherokee lady, <coughs> excuse me, from North Carolina, and she was serving with Lloyd at the Indian Arts and Crafts Board. Lloyd was chairman for 30 some years, and she was a commissioner with uh, him, and they were extremely close friends. At her house, there was a reception and she knew me from the embassy. We became very close friends. Now that brings another question, why we became such close friends? Because I met so many wonderful people, but she became my very personal friend. Um, as a child, I grew up in Turkey, as uh, Della mentioned, I was born there. We were in a wonderful city of Adana where there is a major American Air Force base still there, but it's under different circumstances now. Um, so we were very familiar with Americans. They were our neighbors, tenants, and friends. My sister married to a gentleman from Tennessee as she was serving as a secretary to the Air Force General as his personal secretary. They met, and so she moved uh, to uh, USA in the 60s. But as a child, uh, we lived in a neighborhood that was behind this magnificent movie theater with the box seating and velvet curtains, you know, those of 50s, 60s, wonderful times. And there, I grew up watching nothing but Native Americans and cowboys and Indian movies. So between the two, I chose Indians to support. <laughs> we would yell and scream as little kids, and the neighborhood children were always welcome free through the back door because the owner of the movie theater knew the neighborhood. So uh, I developed this incredible secret, however, uh, passion and interest and love for Native Americans. So the major uh, idea uh, with the Indians came to me when I was 13. My mother was fixing us dresses for a holiday. It's like ho Easter holiday. We all wear new dresses. So I said to my mother that I want my dress to be shoulderless, like the Indian girl was wearing in the movie. <laughs> now you have to think this is 1960s, uh, back in that kind of a sort of conservative country. Mom said, no way, you're too young for that. So I remember, but I didn't remember this for a long time, but it hit me somewhere along the road. Um, I just banged my hand on the table. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> now they sound good. Look at that. Um, I said to, to my mother, okay then, someday I'm gonna go to America, marry an Indian, we're gonna come back naked on the horseback. <laughs> <coughs> and my mother turned to my older sisters, she said, where does she get her ideas? 
<laughs> she thought we were just going to movies, but it was more to it, you know. So anyway, I forgot all about this, and eventually I went to USIS back then. There was an agency of the United States. They had wonderful libraries in our hometown, and I read books about natives, and my other uh, crush was Abe Lincoln, because now I know he looks like Lloyd somewhat. <laughs> Well, anyway, eventually I went to, um, I finished my high school there, then I went to university uh, in Istanbul. When I finished, uh, I did uh, journalism my, as my formal education. But then my sister insisted that I should come and visit her in Washington. That's how I arrived to Washington, but only for three months because I had a wonderful job. Um, and I, uh, came to Washington with the condition in advance from my sister and her husband that they have to take me to some Native American places. They said they will. And deep down in my heart, there was another thing, but it never happened so far. That was, I have seen Elvis in blue Hawaii. I thought maybe I go, <laughs> I go to Hawaii. That didn't work out so far because Lois said, I take you anywhere you want, but we're not going to Hawaii. <laughs> Because um, I think during the, when they returned from the war, uh, they landed in Hawaii and they got bad, they got drunk and whatnot. So he didn't have a good memory of Hawaii. He didn't want to go. So anyway, I came to Washington in 1970 with the condition that I would only stay three months. And now it's 45 years later, I'm still here. And that during that time, I work in different places. I was on Capitol Hill. This is why his story is so complex. Uh, my sister was running the beauty shop uh, for the wives of U.S. congressmen, uh, U.S. House of Representatives. So there I met, of all people, late Morris Udall of Arizona and his wife. They became very close friends. And I worked for them, volunteered, because Mo was running for president in 1976. I became their personal shopper. I mean, life took me to so unusual places and to people. I kept saying okay to my sister. If time she said, would you stay a little longer? So eventually I became a citizen, of course, through the office of uh, Moyudol because they thought I was very hard worker. And um, we had a good time together <clears throat> as a, a friend and family. And I joined them throughout their campaign, actually, in 1976. Um, then I moved to Turkish Embassy. There, this lady I mentioned uh, became my good friends. And uh, after Ambassador retired, uh, end of six years in my career, uh, she invited me to her house. That's where I met Lloyd for the first time. And six years later at the Smithsonian. And um, all I have to say is I have to give credit to my friend. Um, she did a lot of matchmaking behind my back. I didn't know anything about it. <clears throat> First time I got a call from the uh, ambassador's wife from Turkey, who, they became almost like my family and they were very close with this lady. She called me in the middle of the week, uh, early in the morning, and she said, well, if you're moving, please make sure you leave me your address. And I was just half asleep. I didn't know what she was talking about. So she said, oh, well, yeah, like, I, I said, I'm not moving anywhere. But they said, she said, well, what if you're moving to New Mexico or something? <laughs> and, like 6 o'clock in the morning. I had no idea what she was talking about. Uh, well, who knows? She said, you might be marrying or something. And I said, oh, that's Edie. Oh, she acted like, oh, who is Edie? I don't know. So she told my boss's wife that, uh, Lloyd, his very distinguished friend, uh, had met me, and he was so smitten by me and that we would get married. <laughs> <clears throat> so then she calls me, uh, Lloyd is in town, you know, and staying, it, uh, she had a little apartment at the Watergate, and they lived in North Carolina somewhere, but Lloyd always stayed there. Would you please check on him and, you know, see if he needs anything? And of course I did, because in our culture we grow up, I mean, it's mandatory, elderly people we respect great deal, regardless of our conditions. So I said, of course I will. So I picked him up from the airport not knowing anything. And then it turned out she told Lloyd that I was in love with him. <laughs> and she told me that he was in love with me. I said, well, why doesn't he tell me that? They said, well, she said, well, 
he will, he's shy. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> so in any case, um, he kept coming for the meetings for the NMAI. Uh, and then during that time, we had a, a regional meeting in, I believe it was in Seattle. Then we moved to San Francisco for uh, another meeting. He was there for the Indian Arts and Crafts Board meeting. So he invited me to Santa Fe, just come visit him. So I came in 1995, October, and it was beautiful. It's still my most beautiful memory of New Mexico, frankly, balloon festival. He picked me up at the airport and I saw the balloons. It was just a beautiful scene. So then he invited me a month later to come to Thanksgiving dinner in his house. He, his house was a hippie house. There were all kinds of people coming in and going out. Everybody had a key. So there were some Hollywood characters. There were artists. Um, in any case, I found it very nice and relaxing comparing to my life in Washington, which is usually very stiff. <laughs> so at the dinner, um, he sat down and he always loved to make a speech at the dinners. He said, well, me and my fiance here would like to welcome you. <laughs> and then we all looked at each other. They asked me from both sides. I said, I don't know, I will find out. <laughs> so that's my Lloyd for you. He was, <laughs> he was so sweet. <laughs> yeah.